If you've heard this music, imitated this voice, their defense made the big plays that Denver's did not. Seen this catch. Throws his pass. Caught by Clark. Or laughed at these moments. They're killing me, Wally. They're killing me. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. You can thank Ed Sable, the producer of our football lives. There's no way that the NFL would be the powerful sport that it is today without Ed Sable. You gonna be a football player when you grow up? Mm -hmm. Today is the best day of your life. Believe me, he might be the finest quarterback produced in the last 10 years. Philadelphia Eagles select Donovan McNabb. And they said, I'm the best decision this organization has ever made. Yeah, he, he, he's gonna be like, that's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life, I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. That's right, it's a game for men. That's the life. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it. Was this the final game on the sidelines for a great coach? I want to thank you very much for making my day in the sun so memorable. In the summer of 2011, 94-year-old Ed Sable became the oldest member ever enshrined into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I wanted to show you my speech. What the hell happened to me? Hey, don't get up. The commissioner. The commissioner. The commissioner. Oh, big guy. The commi oh, this is the big guy right here. I could only turn so far. This is the big guy. So I only saw half your face. <laughs> it's good to see you. Congratulations. Nice Thank you for coming. Thank you. And lastly, finally, remember forever as the man behind the idea of NFL films. It is my honor and pleasure to announce. Congratulations on your night tonight. Hey, nice to see you, pal. Godfather, Godfather. You're right. We gotta do it again for the cameras. I mean, man. I mean. By the way, uh, NFL Network has said Steel. what I do now is yeah. we call the what you tell. <laughs> for free agent so many of us. Yeah. 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 This was a moment 50 years in the making. And it was fitting that Sable's NFL career ended with a Hall of Fame jacket. Because that's exactly where his story starts. Five decades earlier, he wasn't only wearing jackets, he was selling them. When uh, I married my wife Audrey, her father had a very successful overcoat manufacturing business. And so I started following him around the factory. He never really actually asked me to join the company, but my mother-in-law said, you just keep walking around with him. I kept walking around with him for 15 years. Every weekend, my grandfather used to come over and eat dinner with us, and he would be get my dad in the corner, and he'd be telling him about this, and you got to do this. And, and you could just see my dad was so was so bored with it, and he'd see me over in the corner, and my grandfather would be like this, and my dad would look at me, and then he'd go... You know, he'd make these funny faces. Of course, my grandfather, he didn't even know it, but to me, that epitomized my dad's feelings towards selling overcoats. He found it boring. 
it was unfulfilling, and he was a showman at heart, and his hobby was movies. Home movies at the time, but you could see that that's what he really wanted to do. I started with a gift, a wedding gift, uh, of a little 16 millimeter camera about that big. And I started taking pictures with it, and I just got enamored with it. I thought it was a fabulous thing. Coming out of the house, going down the steps, getting in the car, getting out of the car, going up the steps, getting in the house. I must have shot that every day for, I don't know. And then everything Steve did, I shot. I don't remember my father having a head in those days. It was just this, this, these arms and this metal camera on top of his shoulders. My first pony ride, my first haircut, uh, my first football game, my dad filmed me. Steve was playing at Haverford School and I would go down there and shoot the practices and then I'd go up in a building and shoot the games and give the film to the coach and the coach, he never had that done before and loved it. So uh, I kept shooting. My grandfather got to the point where he was going to retire. And by this time, he'd figured out that he was not going to turn the business over to my father. So what he did was sell the business. My father took that money and he bought a Mercedes. He bought two horses. He bought a new home. And he did exactly what my grandfather was concerned about, that he was squandering all the money. But at one point, my dad decided now he wanted to create a business. And what better business did he know than making movies? So he decided to make his hobby his profession. Sable named his new film company after his daughter, Blair. Finding an exciting subject matter was not as easy. I uh, went to New York and went to the uh, Bahamas Tourist Board and I presented them with an idea to make a film touring the Bahamas in a little single-engine airplane. Nothing spectacular, but at least I got enough money to buy a couple more lenses. And then I had some friends at the uh, aquarium that opened in Philadelphia, and they were talking about trying to get a little whale in the aquarium, and I spoke to them about, hey, how about if I go up to Nova Scotia and try to catch a little whale up there and then bring it down to you. And they said, great idea. I didn't even catch a herring. I couldn't catch anything. That was the end of my whaling trip. Moby Dick, that's what I should have called it. Chasing white whales suited Sable. And he was about to reel in the biggest catch of his life on a subject he had already been filming for 15 years. Being the thinker that he was and the visionary, it was easy for him to make the leap from the little boys team to the National Football League. I thought, well, there's the top, boy. If you could shoot football for the National Football League, that would be something. I had found out through a little research that the previous year, Telra got the bid for $2,500. So I said, look, I don't want to mess around. I want this badly. I'm going to double that. I'm going to put in a bid for $5,000. Put the check in the envelope, went up to the meeting, gave it to the commissioner. He said, I have a bid here from Blair Motion Pictures for $5,000, but I'm going to withhold awarding the bid until tomorrow at the end of business. And when I later asked Pete why he did that, he says, Ed, I never heard of you. I didn't know whether you could even make a film, so I had to do some checking to see if you had a camera. One day and a three martini lunch later, Ed Sable was awarded the film rights for his first NFL production. I think this game was about minus 10 with the chill factor, that's the wind blowing. You know, that was just a severe afternoon to shoot movies. Well, thank God I didn't know more. I didn't realize that the film could freeze. I didn't realize that a cameraman, if he put his face against the camera, it would stick to the camera. So I didn't know about that. I just said, let's go. Shoot. That's all. Shoot everything that moves. The bench knows that the right play could ice the game. No pun intended. Here's the right play. Paydirt is just 30 yards away. Jerry Kramer kicks. And the ball finds it. Sable won the rights to the 1963 championship for $10,000. In 1964, the price was 20000 
The cost of business was rising too quickly for Blair Motion Pictures. So I went to Pete Roselle and I said, Pete, I think the National Football League has to start their own film company. And I said, I even have the name NFL Films. They said, fine. Since that day, NFL Films has proven Emmy worthy and Ed Sable Hall of Fame worthy. One of the writers says that in the final ballot room, that the writers are told, can you write the history of the NFL without mentioning blank? And that's before you vote for someone. Well, I know one thing for sure. You can't see the history of the NFL without Ed Sable. The music, the interesting camera angles, make it more compelling for me than, than watching an actual game. Ed Sable is one of the true giants in the sports industry. Without him, you wouldn't have these iconic heroes. And Pazarczyk fumbles the football. It's picked up by Herman Edwards. I don't believe it. The legacy that Ed leaves behind is an absolutely vast one. Every time someone sees a close-up shot of a football spiraling through the air, that's an Ed Sable shot. He gave us that. Ed Sable was proud of the work he did. He was proud of his association with the NFL. And he made the NFL uh, a better league. That's a great legacy. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass, caught by Clark. It was just a big, fun thing, and it happened to turn out pretty good. Ed Sable's cameraman and Ed Sable's mission were initially regarded as a nuisance by most of the league's 14 teams. Get that thing! They used to write Pete letters and tell him, uh, who does this guy Sable think he is? He's destroying the game. He, if he wants to be Daryl Zanuck, let him go out to Hollywood, get rid of him. Bringing Hollywood to the NFL was exactly what Ed Sable wanted to do. When people said, you know, your dad's going to end up buying a team, you wait and see, that's really what he wants to do. Well, I knew that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to run a film studio. My dad loved Hollywood. The first thing I noticed on his desk, he's got a sign, Ed Sable, king of football movies. Well, right then and there, he's got me. He was like the original film moguls. Their vision is what made them great, and that's what uh, Big Ed brought to it. He cared about the romance and the adventure. That's what the style of NFL films became. I said, look, we can't copy television. We gotta do it something different. We gotta get in closer. We gotta get to the faces, to the eyes, because when they wear those helmets and those masks, you couldn't see anybody's face. And I wanna see the, the hands when they're down in the dirt and the cleats kicking up the dirt. And everybody could tell the difference when we were shooting a game and when it was a television game. Like a Hollywood mogul, Ed Sable spared no expense when it came to finding a signature look for his fledgling studio. In slow motion, we see John Brody relying on Bernie Casey, San Francisco's leading pass receiver. I said to our cameraman uh, in one of our games, why don't we shoot the whole game slow motion? Oh, you can't shoot the whole game slow motion, that cost a fortune. Because when you shoot slow motion, through a movie camera, the film has gone through there like water out of a spigot. And boy, it's just building up dollars. It's like a, like a taxi cab meter. And nobody wanted to take that expense. It was so great to see slow motion in football. And that's all the people talked about. And I thought, if that's all the people are talking about, and that's what they like, and hell, I'm going to give him the whole game that way. A lot of people would say, Ed, how did you decide to shoot that game in slow motion? Well, pal, I shot every play in slow motion. I didn't miss one play. <laughs> NFL Films was pioneering new ways of seeing pro football. But Ed Sable 
also wanted his audience to hear the game. When I would stand on the sideline of a pro game, the sounds used to scare me. I mean, I, I don't know how they could live through that. Bam, bam. So I said, we got to get that. That 24 is a little Let's, let's wrap him. Then it came to me, if I could put a, a, a microphone on a coach, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't the fans like to hear what a coach says on the sidelines? Get out of bounds, Speedy. Out of bounds, you stupid guy. Everybody grabbing out there. Nobody tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. That became a such an integral part of the NFL film style. I am mouth at 20, you couldn't cover me. <laughs> the human drama and comedy of that, uh, Big Ed could see how, how that sold the sport. They're killing me, why are they killing me? You couldn't write lines like the stuff that came out of that. What is it like to be in a locker room? What is it like to be in a team meeting room? Well, Ed found a way to let the world know what it's like to be in the room. If we die, we die together. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done. That's what changed uh, the game. I really do think it changed the game in creating a greater audience for this league. Dad wanted to portray football the way Hollywood portrayed fiction, and that is with the big music, the drama, the color the storyline. It starts with a whistle and ends with a gun. 60 minutes of close in action from kickoff to touchdown. This is pro football, the sport of our time. That was the Citizen Kane um, sports films at the time. And I remember when Pete Rozelle saw that film, he says, you know, that isn't a highlight film, that's a real movie. And the next day we got a call from Pete and he, had us come up to his office in New York and he told my father and I that if the NFL was to grow and to flourish it would have to succeed on television and in order to succeed on television it would need a certain image, a mystique and then he put the paper down and he said and the film I saw yesterday that's the way we want to market the league by making movies with a Hollywood gloss NFL Films helped pro football become the number one sport in America. On Sunday, the game comes alive. Pro football, the game for the ear and the eye. A two and a half hour carnival of color, sound and action. 16 seconds. Time enough for one more play. Time enough for daring. Time enough for failure. Time enough for Lombardi to win a third straight NFL championship. It was very simple. You have a picture, you have words, and you have music. I didn't have to read a script and say, well, I wonder if the public will like this or find a star and say, I wonder if he or she will go over. I had the game. For the Sables, Hall of Fame Induction Day was a family affair. The founder of NFL Films, Ed Sable, who for nearly 50 years revolutionized the way we imagine the game of pro football. Was it time for the king of football movies to join the Hall of Famers he helped bring to the living rooms of America? That's a tough question, but it's an honest question. And I'm going to be honest. I just can't see myself, oh yeah, I wouldn't turn it down and I'd feel very flattered. But I don't think, I don't think it'll happen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the announcement of the names that we've all been waiting for. The Pro Football Hall of Fame 2011 Class of Enshrinees consists of Richard Dent, Marshall Falk, Chris Hanberger. Number four is Les Richter. The fifth name on our list is Ed Sable. Congratulations 
to the ball. Hello. Dad. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. I finally made it. Did, did we get the camera? Did you get the shot? Yeah, he's still shooting. In fact, he's shooting me right now. <laughs> From the time he could walk, Steve Sable was holding a camera. It was this interest in film and a passion for playing football that made him the perfect hire at his father's new company. I got a call from my father, and I always remember this phone call. He said, you know, I can see by your grades that all you've been doing out there is playing football and going to the movies. But that makes you uniquely qualified for this profession. If someone were to ask me how would I define our job at NFL Films, I'd say it is to bring a new understanding and a new perspective to something that's already been seen. Uh, to give a creative treatment to reality. Or in other words, to make a film and not an instant replay. Steve Sable was one of several talented individuals that helped NFL Films create its identity. Another was a local hero who became the company's vocal hero. Bob, I don't know about you, I'm disappointed with the first half. I noticed there was a fellow on the evening 11 o'clock news in Philadelphia whose voice I thought was great. And his name was John Facenda. So I said, John, you know, I, I like your voice. How would you like to narrate one of our films? Oh, eh, I'd be delighted, you know, the way he spoke. And when I heard it, it was like Moses or God was talking to us through the city. Listen to that. From the very first play, Super Bowl XII was a coach's nightmare. It was fiercely fought, but frightfully flawed. Facenda's voice was one of the most remarkable instruments in the history of broadcasting. The autumn wind is a pirate, blustering in from sea. With a rollicking song, he sweeps along, swaggering boisterously. John Facenda could read a laundry list and make it sound like the Constitution of the United States. This one simple fact tipped the balance of the game in the Cowboys' favor. Their defense made the big plays that Denver's did not. They remembered our films more for John Facenda and our music than anything else. With composer Sam Spence, Ed Sable found yet another important contributor for his creative team. Spence specialized in Hollywood-style soundtracks. I always thought that, you know, Hollywood, their music was always so great. Those war films, The Longest Day, had great music and, and uh, Patton. Oh, that, that had great music. The biggest influences on me were, of course, all the big Hollywood composers. Then we thought, why not use the same type of sounds and melodies and, uh, for football? Ed was a great guy. He had a way of dealing with people that made you feel you're part of the, his family, you know? Ed Sable's films celebrated teamwork and leadership. His company grew and thrived by practicing those same virtues. Leadership in a film company means the liberation of talent and that you're not here to be a boss, you're here to bring people in and give them the opportunity to be their best. My father always used to say, treat everyone as a gentleman, not because they are, but because you are. That philosophy has continued for five decades, and the Sables became the first family of pro football. Ed got into the story and the drama. Steve was the art, was the eye, but Ed was the soul. Listen, Steve, get the national anthem, will you please? Shirley Kelly, don't forget. There are few things in life that are more beautiful than a father-son relationship uh, that's built on true love, but also a shared common interest. And Steve and Ed have a relationship, both personally and artistically, that's unlike any other that I've ever seen. Now, Steve, I want you to look at all the great guys you got supporting yeah, you. I see. You haven't got a damn thing to do but sit in your ass and look important that's and right, sign on. That's right. should be. 
That's the way it should be. No, it should be that way for me, <laughs> not for you. It was more like equals. Not quite equals, because he was the boss. But, boy, did he allow Steve to grow into what Steve became. When the king of football movies arrived in Canton, Ohio, he was the main attraction. Even when in the company of the men who had starred in his films. I've been seeing you in 30 years. Yes, sir. Boy. I've been a long time. You're getting younger, I'm getting older. <laughs> I've been seeing you in 50 years. Oh, you saw me before. I'm still flying, too, you know. I just flew down here. I'm a bonanza. I've been seeing you in a long time. I know, it's been a long you're time. You're a busy guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know you're doing a good job. You ought to try television. Hey, Ray. All right, everybody right at the lens, looking good, looking good. I haven't seen him all in, in, in 30, 40 years. Very good. Uh, it's amazing that they get so many people together uh, who are so far apart. Now you're one of them. Yeah. A little late, just in time. <laughs> good name for a song, just in time. I left it just in time. Ed Sable was always ready with a song and a dance. As a young man, he was drawn to the footlights like a moth to a flame. He had a brief career on Broadway. He was with the Ritz brothers, who were sort of the, the Kmart version of the Marx brothers. And it was a kind of comedy where they'd come out with a shotgun and they'd bang the shotgun on the, on the ground. The shotgun would go a boom and a duck would fall down. I mean, it's that real kind of slap, but that's what my father loved. He was a comedian, a born comedian. And he loved to perform. No matter where we traveled, there would be some instance where he'd just break out into a soft shoe. He amused himself tremendously. That was his hobby. My father's hobby was himself on film. I think he really studied himself that way. It's probably how he knew how to sell. Ed Sable knew that comedy sells. And when he produced a film that emphasized the slapstick side of pro football, a popular new genre was born. We made a film called Football Follies uh, to show mistakes with the funny music. Became the biggest film we ever made. They say uh, as many people saw that as Gone with the Wind. I got 50. I got I 76. Got no, Joe, I got you got him. 45. Who's got no, 30? I got 45. I got him. I got that guy. Okay, all set. Hey, who's got 45? I thought you had 45. I've got 77. Who's got 48? Who's I got, got 88? 48. I got 88. Time out. But the NFL establishment had a hard time buying the Follies concept. They said, well, why would we want to show players making mistakes? Fumbles, interceptions, missed kicks. People loved it, and they loved it when they would go to sporting events at bars, and they would put that film up on the screen, and people would scream laughing. They were great hits, and uh, once again, Ed was right, and uh, we went back to uh, scheduling the games and uh, assigning the referees, and we let Ed uh, take charge of the creativity. It seems to me a mistake to limit an authentic genius merely to film. I think that uh, in the reorganized structure, Pete can move on to industry where he more properly belongs, and you can assume the coveted role of commission. Would you answer the phone, uh, Jack, please? You're not doing a damn thing out there. <laughs> like Howard Cosell and Ed Sable, Hank Stram loved the spotlight. But Sable had to be more salesman than showman to convince the Chiefs head coach to wear a wireless microphone in Super Bowl IV. I said, Hank, I have to see you. 
and I had a, a, a transmitter and a microphone. And I said, Hank, now don't fly off the handle. Here's what I want to do. We want to do something's never been done before. Something the whole country's going to talk about. We want to put a wireless mic on you, and we're not really interested in the score or the outcome. I said, why don't you call Bud Grant? I said, he's a good friend, a great guy, a great coach and everything. Call Bud, let him do it. And I said, Hank, listen, you'll go down in history. It'll be something that your grandchildren, your children, they'll never forget for years, forever. And I could see his eyes light up. I could see a little smile on his face. He said, uh, what about the honorarium? Hank, I said, I hate to tell you this. There is no honorarium. This is something that has never been done and it's going to go down in history, and you're going to benefit no end. He said, all right, get out of here. We'll do it. Okay, let's do let's a go. job. Hey, up, these let's guys go, can't move the ball way, against us. Let's do the job on it, babies. Come on. Let's go, boys. Hey, let's go, man. He was excellent because he was a good talker. He had funny expressions. Come on, Lenny. Pump it in there, baby. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. Come on, let's negotiate the ball down the field, Leonard. Look for 65 toss power trap. What does it look like? Hey, look for a 65 toss power trap. Let's see what it looks like. Come on. 65 toss power trap. Right, it might pop wide open, Rats. That was a term of affection for him. He called all his players rats. Okay, rats. Yes, sir, rats. Yes, sir, boys. Yes, sir, boys. Yes, sir, rats. It was there, wasn't it? Hank was a showman. How in the world can all six of you miss a play like that? All six of you miss a play. Mr. Official, let me ask you something. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? All six of you. The ball jumped out of there as soon as we made contact. I thought you were talking about you being on the field. No. What? For years, when I would see Coach Stram afterwards, he would always say, Ed, I never realized what that meant to my career. Every place I go, airports, every place, state, everybody yells out, 65 toss power truck. Hey, you rats, rats. Nice going. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> it was great that he won to wire a coach and have him win the game. Marvelous. Bingo. I hit the jackpot. I got the coach, he won, and he was wired. Can't beat that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Let's go. Not much different than the uh, previous Super Bowls. Uh, it might be a longer day. This is the first time we're going to be shooting a, a Super Bowl at night. So we have a longer span of concentration. But we are a team, and all I want to say is this. We're all going to start this thing together, and we're going to finish it together and everybody's going to chip in like we always do and help each other and let's have another great game. The general of NFL Films spent two years as a common foot soldier. After I got married and had my first child, I was drafted. I then joined the uh, fourth division in the infantry I was a rifleman Next thing I know, I was on my way to Europe. One of the things that Steve and I are really curious about, and my father will not talk about it, is the war. And all I can remember is they were probably the worst days of my life. I was scared to death all the time, but so were the other guys. There's a, a whole piece of my father having to do with the war that is his alone. Coaches intrigued him the way generals intrigued him. He loved the army, and coaches were generals. The producer. The producer. <laughs> That's why he loves Vince Lombardi so much. That's the old story of first impressions, of getting to meet someone for the first time, and they're not always like they seem to be. Lombardi was always had that tough exterior. Now, what's going on out here? What the hell's going on? And when I would come out and try to talk to him about filming his practice, no way. It took a long time to keep talking to him at every owner's meeting. And I think one of the lines that he loved best was when I finally said, you know, coach, I'm going to make you the John Wayne of pro football. And oh, he liked that. Come on, machine. Let's go here. You got to circle around right down the field. Vince became a, a very 
a good booster of ours. And it was a great, great thing for me because I, I sort of idolized Lombardi. Of all the people in the league, he was, he was my hero. Why don't you clean these off for a while so we can have a drink with you, please? How do you know they're on? I know, it must be on. Ah, you got all the lights on. He doesn't swear, smoke, drink, or spit. His favorite beverage is milk. His favorite movie is the sound of music. And his middle name is Herbert. That was George Allen, another one of my favorites. He was, he was, I, I, I love to talk to George. George had a one-track set, football. That's all that mattered. You could invite George Allen to, to dinner with five or six other people. And if the topic wasn't related to or about football, George's eyes would be up at the ceiling. He'd be looking around, you know, he wouldn't be into it. Like George Allen, Ed Sable had a one-track mind. I don't, I know that once he got right in the middle of NFL films, if he had any other acquaintances, and if they were, they had to be people that would sit and talk to him about NFL films, because that's all he cared about. And that kind of uh, intense focus was what built the company. I don't like to have any cameras in our meeting room or people around because uh, when we have them here, <clears throat> it isn't the same. But Ed Sable does a great job and we've agreed to let him come back. Dad was superstitious. He was secretive and superstitious. Ed, Ed Sable broke the barriers on both of those. Okay, here we to go. get my dad mic'd for a game is incredible. To get him mic'd for a preseason game would have been a major accomplishment. Alan's superstitious nature and a wireless microphone proved to be an uneasy fit. You see this damn thing is the jinx I have on. You see this? This is the damn jinx. See? Joe, you see what I mean? Everything? See what I mean? I tell you what, I'd like to get this damn thing and get this. So I don't want to go in the dugout because if I do, it's too obvious, you know? We weren't losing the game. We were, it was 7-7 and he swore that microphone <laughs> was the reason we hadn't scored more in that game. Joe, I tell you what, I got to get this jinx thing off of us. We got to get, let's go in the dugout and take it off right now. Come on, go ahead. Come on, good, come on with me. I'm going to have to let those damn guys down. I'm going to take this damn microphone off. I don't feel like, I, I feel like it's going to give me the jinx. It was a way that he thought that you'd look at him and you'd want to laugh, but you'd say, golly, he's serious. He really means all this stuff. And you had to like him. He was like a little boy. He loved what he was doing. Loved every second of it. Just remember this. 40 men together can't lose. Okay. You see the common goal. That's what NFL Films and Ed were able to capture that the America didn't know about. The devotion of these players and coaches and how special their passion was. That was captured. No one knew that before Ed Sable came along. Three cheers for the Redskins. My father trusted Ed Sable's passion for the game. After a lifetime of movie making, Ed Sable had prepared his final script, this one for the Hall of Fame. Mr. Sable, how are you, sir? You can call me Ed. Okay, Ed, yeah, not well, but congratulations. Thank you for helping. So meaningful, so well deserved. And, well, and, and that's all the more reason why we should be sitting here. What an honor. What an honor. Pro <laughs> football came to life in our living rooms all week long. It still does. Thanks to its founder, Ed Sable. Oh, <laughs> Not bad, huh? <laughs> I dreamt the dream, the impossible dream. I dreamt the impossible dream. And I'm living it right this minute. I said that twice 
because at my age, you know, your memory starts to go a little bit. <laughs> In case I forgot it, I would have a backup. <laughs> I have been to many of these events in the past, and the enshrinees would usually come up and most of them would say pretty much the same thing. They would congratulate their pro coach, their college coach, but I didn't have the luxury of the advice for all those wonderful coaches. But I do have some fans, and those fans are all you people sitting out there in those seats. As we get to the end of this, I just want to say thank you, which really doesn't mean much when I say thank you. It's not adequate. Al Jolson, who is an old-time entertainer way before your time. And when he finished his act, he used to say, folks, you ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. He was an overcoat salesman, turned filmmaker, a showman, and a salesman, a boss, and a father. And now, Ed Sable is a Hall of Famer. When you look back at your life, I mean, you've got to have a great sense of satisfaction of what you've accomplished and how long you lived and you still have your marbles at, at 94, you're sitting here, you know, lucid, remembering things that happened 75 years ago. That's well, Steve, you're absolutely right about that. That's the truth. And I agree with you. I'm lucky. I really am. I, I was lucky. I did something. So, that's about it. See, I, I don't know, I can only, I, I, when I look at my father, I can only speak as the way a son would view a father. Okay, that's a wrap. You got, you got I'm not finished, I'm getting warmed up now. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest man I ever met. Not only my, my father, uh, but my best friend, uh, the best man at my wedding, my boss. Well, so that's, that's, it, a, that's another show. <laughs> And, and above all, uh, a entrepreneurial visionary. Where do we play next week, Steve? <laughs>